And now the collect. The collect for the 14th Sunday after Trinity. Merciful God, your Son came to save us and bore our sins on the cross. May we trust in your mercy and know your love, rejoicing in the righteousness that is ours, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We will now sing our first hymn. Until he should pay the debt. 
But when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Reverend Gemma. I'm part of the team in Finch Hampstead and California Parish. And this morning, I'm really excited to be able to preach for you, thinking about the parable of the unforgiving servant. So let's begin with a prayer. I speak in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The kingdom of God is like a man who worked in a minimum wage job, cleaning the offices of a multi-million billion pound international company. This man, he owed the CEO and owner of this company a hundred million pounds. One day, in order to prepare for his next audit, the owner of this company came to his minimum wage worker and said, pay me all that you owe. Now the worker clearly didn't have that money and he threw himself on the mercy of his employer saying, please, please have mercy on me. Instead of throwing the man away and pursuing him to get his house, his car, all of his possessions, the CEO decided to take pity on the man and forgive him the debt. And this man on leaving the CEO's office went down to the ground floor of that beautiful building and bumped into one of his co-workers who owed him a thousand pounds. He grabbed the man who owed him a thousand pounds, shook him violently and said, pay me what you owe me now. The second man who owed the first the thousand pounds said, I, I don't have the money to pay you. I please, please, will you just give me more time? But the first man, instead of forgiving him, said no, contacted a debt agency and began to pursue the second man, costing him everything that he had. Our parable this morning talks about forgiveness. It talks about what it is to forgive and what it is to not forgive. And it paints a really vivid image that doesn't take a big imaginative leap to understand how it applies to our own lives, how it applies to knowing we are forgiven and to knowing that we should forgive. I retell that story and use those ridiculous figures, a hundred million and a thousand pounds, not because they are directly in correlation with what's in scripture, but because they do exactly the same thing as the numbers in scripture do. They shock you into thinking about the reality. There's no way somebody working minimum wage could ever pay back a hundred million pounds. It's just not possible. And the figure used in our gospel passage this morning, where this man owes 10,000 talents, 10,000 talents is more than a slave would ever see in their lifetime. In fact, one talent was probably more than they could ever hope to earn. And so it just gives you the idea of the ridiculousness of, of the debt that was forgiven. And yet in comparison, a thousand pounds or the denarii that are mentioned in the scripture telling is a much smaller amount and yet the man still cannot bring himself to forgive. It's the cold heartedness of the first slave I think that always shocks me in this story. The thing that gives us the most pause is that he's given forgiven so much, such a vast amount, 
and yet in comparison he cannot forgive a small amount and reacts so badly. There's no pausing to celebrate, no enjoyment of his freedom. He's just instantly unforgiving and angry with the person who owes him. It's clear to understand what this parable is getting at. We don't have to spend too long trying to guess who the king or in my retelling the CEO is. God is the one for whom he has so much to give and has forgiven so much for us. And we can so often forget to live out forgiveness in return by holding on to grudges and being angry with one another. When Peter asks at the start of this parable, how often should I forgive? Seven times? Jesus replies, no, no, 77 times. And just like the actual amounts of money in this parable aren't important, the actual numbers Jesus uses aren't important either. Seven is a holy number. So Peter's saying to Jesus, how often should I forgive? Enough to be holy? And Jesus's response is not, yes, yes, that's fine. It's no, much more than that. You should forgive beyond what it is to be holy. You should forgive completely and wholly. As Christians, we are in a unique position to understand that we are forgiven. We are the one who had such a huge debt taken from us. In fact, we've been given so much that it would be difficult for us ever to pay it back. We are the ones who have had God forgive such a debt that it changed the whole world. God's act of forgiveness changed our relationship with him. Our relationship was one of debt and action and repayment step by step and yet through God's one act of forgiveness he changes it to an open and loving friendship family relationship where we can ever go to him and be loved through that cross-shaped act of forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't just about knowing that we've done something wrong and saying sorry for it. To forgive somebody, we need to be willing to let go of our anger. I don't know about you, but I often find that there are people in my life who even just their name popping up on my phone or on social media frustrates me for whatever reason. But actually, I know I should forgive them because actually it's not doing me any good. Forgiveness is like the cross. It brings life and joy and celebration. It should be life-giving. There's a quote that sometimes is associated with Nelson Mandela or Annie Lamont or various other people, but basically says something along the lines of, not forgiving somebody is the same as taking poison and expecting them to die. Unforgiveness stops us being able to live our lives in the way we should because it fills up some of us, the space in our hearts with something that shouldn't be there. But please don't get me wrong, we should forgive, but it does not mean that we should continue to put ourselves into situations where we can be abused. Forgiving somebody who bullied us doesn't mean going back to that situation to continue to be bullied. Jesus says to the woman who was caught in adultery that she was forgiven, but she needs to go and sin no more. There needs to be a change of heart and change of situation. If you are forgiving somebody but they don't change their ways, you still need to remove yourself from that situation. And this passage has been misused to keep people in bad relationships over the years when all forgiveness should be life-giving and life-changing and life-affirming. The Lord's Prayer has the lines Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The implication there is clear, that we are forgiven, that all the things that we've done that mar our relationship with God, 
when we've relied too much on ourselves, when we've done things we know God would not want us to do. All those things are wiped away by the cross. And in return, we should be able to do what the first slave did not do and forgive others. And I said that forgiveness should be life-giving. And so I'd like you to imagine for a moment, what does it mean to forgive? But think about that slave or the worker in my retelling. If instead of being angry about what they were owed, they'd gone home and really considered what had happened, that they'd had more money than they could ever imagine wiped away. How would that have changed their life? I can only imagine that a debt that large weighs so heavily on a person that it becomes a constant thing that they are thinking about, something that steals joy from every element of their life. So to have it taken away, to be free, to be able to be almost your own person again, to redefine who you are, how incredible is that? How big a celebration should that person have had? How big the party, how much the celebrating and sharing all that they had gained should they have been? That's what it means to be forgiven and to forgive others. It's the opportunity to live wholly the life that God would want us to have, that celebratory, appreciative life where we know that we are loved and we can share love with one another. So that's why we should go out and forgive as much as we can so that we as Christians are known as a people who love and forgive. Amen. We now come to that great statement of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. We say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, we now come to our intercessions. Our intercessions this morning have been written by Paul Arscott. Everlasting God, Lord of compassion and gracious understanding, we come with an openness to express our concerns for the Church and for the world, and to thank you for your goodness. Merciful God, we recognise that the work of helping people through life can leave church leaders vulnerable to spiritual attack. We thank you for our church leaders and pray that they will not allow criticism or negativity to blunt their ministry, that they will hear encouragement and that they will always respond in love and forgiveness when difficulties arise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for our world, where through the media we see the misery and tragedy brought about by wrong choices and brought into our homes day by day. We pray for wisdom and compassion in all negotiations and decisions taken by our world leaders and ask that there be humility in leadership and responsibility for right actions shared by all. And we particularly pray that this may apply to all things associated with the pandemic. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, help and guide our schools, colleges and universities as they return for the new educational year, especially with all their concerns about the coronavirus and how they will cope with social distancing, but still be with one another and learn with and from one another. May their teachers inspire a love of learning for its own sake and kindle joy in all subjects and sports and help them to grow into caring and knowledgeable adults. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we raise before you those from our parish who are ill, hospitalised or recuperating and for those we know within our families and circle of friends, and especially those on our pew sheet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, give us ears to hear and minds to understand the message of immortality for the children of your kingdom, so that we may look forward with patience and confidence to that time when we will join you in the peace of eternity. And we especially pray for any we know who recently died and are on that journey to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, forgive us for those times when we treat ourselves with less kindness than you do. We want to believe in ourselves the way you believe in us, and so as we go out to live the coming week, show us more of the life you have designed especially for us to live. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. We will now sing our second hymn.
through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ is the bread of life. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate the memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of St. James's, St. Mary and St. John, and St. Eligius, and all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. 
We say together the Agnes Day, the Lamb of God. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink the remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. We say together the post-communion prayer. Lord God, the source of truth and love, Keep us faithful to the Apostles' teaching and fellowship, united in prayer and the breaking of bread, and one in joy and simplicity of heart, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together the prayer after communion. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, just to remind you that the notices will appear on the screen after the blessing and the dismissal. Now the blessing, the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.